So, good morning. So today, the church's calendar marks the festival of Christ the King. Well, who knew? I didn't. Um, and Christ Church is not a church which normally celebrates feast days and saints' days and the likes, uh, except, of course, the main ones like Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. So I thought I'd better look it up and see what it's all about. And this is what I found. Christ the King Feast was initiated in 1925 by Pope Pius XI as a response to the spread of secularism in the modern world and to remind the world of Jesus Christ's rule on mankind. Initially a Roman Catholic holiday celebrated on the last Sunday of October, many Christian denominations have since adopted the holiday. In the Church of England, the Feast of Christ the King falls on the Sunday before Advent, and that's today. So I learnt something new. So the feast was only started in 1925 as a response to secularism in the modern world. How much more do we need to be reminded today that Jesus is our King? And it's also interesting that today is the last Sunday before Advent, as Amanda has said, which starts next week. Now, Advent is technically the beginning of the church's, uh, it's the first Sunday in the church's calendar, so the beginning of the church's year, which means that today is the last Sunday of the church's year. So next week, we begin to look forward to the coming of the Messiah as a baby at Christmas. And the year culminates in a year's time with the proclamation of the establishment of his kingdom with Christ as king, his universal sovereignty. It's like sort of squaring the circle, to use a phrase. It's a sort of completion, and that suits me very nicely because I like things to be neat and tidy. So what does it mean, Jesus is king? In our world today, we have a number of kings. Here in the UK, we have King Charles. In Norway, they have Harold V. In Spain, they have King Philippe VI. And in Thailand, where Andrew and Nice live, they have King Vajiralongkorn. And I read that in general, the roles of a good king include the ability to bring order into lives, unify the people, convey the truth, protect the people from harm, and do what's best for them. Sounds good, doesn't it? But we know that in this world, kings don't always live up to their calling. But King Jesus, he's different. For a start, he's not just a king. He is the king, the Lord of Lords. He is the king of kings of the whole earth. He is the king for those of us who believe. And whether they like it or not, he is the king of those who don't believe. And throughout our Bible, there are many references to Jesus' kingship. And Jesus often spoke of the kingdom. In Matthew's gospel alone, there are around 50 references to his kingdom. And kingdoms have a king. There are also many references in the Old Testament. And one of the most familiar Christmas readings is from Isaiah 9, which says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And this is talking about Jesus who is on the throne. And in Colossians 1, Paul writes, For God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And right at the end of the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, we read this, and it's talking about the last days. In Revelation 17, it reads, They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. And in Revelation 19, it says, On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So God has seated Jesus on the throne and established him as king, and we are subjects in his kingdom. How do you feel about that? The majority of, this, of people in this nation do not recognize Jesus as king, and in 1925, Pope Pius was concerned about the secularization of society. 
he would be incredibly alarmed if he were alive today. So how do you view Jesus Christ as king? For some, Jesus is more like a good luck charm, something to be touched when maybe the going gets a bit tricky. Some see Jesus like a servant, there to do their bidding when they need something. Some see Jesus as their best friend, which isn't a bad thing at all, but they don't put him on the throne of their life. How do you see him? Just think for a moment. Can you submit your life to him as your Lord and King and not just the baby in the manger that we look forward to at Christmas? And why should you? Now this is where we come to today's reading. You might like to keep your Bible open just to refer back to it. It's Ephesians 1. This, our reading today includes the verses, He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. Now that sounds like a king to me. And indeed, there are many references to Jesus' kingdom in all the other letters of Paul. To Paul, Jesus was king of kings and lord of lords. Now, as always, it's good to remind ourselves of the context of our reading. The letter to the Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison in Rome to the church at Ephesus, a church which he had established while he was, um, sorry, while he, he had established and where he spent a number of years building up the leaders and the new believers. It was very dear to his heart. And it's likely that this letter would also have been sent around the local area, so to the churches in modern day Turkey. His letter to the Ephesians is the favorite of many Christians and it gives perhaps the best description of the Christian life in the entire New Testament. And the tone of the letter is one of joy and praise and thanksgiving, and I recommend you have a good read of it. Now, our reading today starts with, for this reason. What reason? We need to have a look at the previous verses to help us make sense of today's passage. And it's in these verses that we see Paul's response to his understanding of the abundance of God's amazing grace. In verse 3, Paul says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And he then goes on to list what those spiritual blessings are. I'm going to run through them very quickly with a brief explanation, but do take time late today or in the week to read through them yourselves. These are the blessings that are promised not only to the Ephesians, but to all Christians and that includes you. If you read them with that mindset, it's really amazing. This is what God has for you and me, sitting here in Christchurch today, as you continue to follow Jesus. So let's have a quick look at them. He chose you before the creation of the world. You are no accident. God created you to know him, and he made you to be holy and blameless in his sight. And this is a truth, no matter what you think about yourself. Because of his great love, he adopted us. We are a son or daughter of God. And this is not a chore for him. It's his choice and his pleasure. He has redeemed us. That's, that means he has paid a price for us so that we can be free from sin. And what's more, be forgiven for those things we've done wrong in the past and continue to receive his forgiveness for those things we continue to get wrong, providing we turn to him and say sorry. This is how we become holy and blameless in his sight and enables us to be friends with God. And this is all undeserved and a result of the grace that he lavishes on us. And lavishes is such a generous word, isn't it? It's no stinginess here, no holding back. And then also we have the privilege of Almighty God sharing with us his plans for the universe. And he also reassures us that these blessings are real, they are for us, and will all be fulfilled in time. 
and to reassure us of this, he gives us his Holy Spirit as a sort of guarantee. Just as Pope Pius in 1925 wanted society to know that Christ is king, so Paul in this letter wanted his readers to know just how amazing God is and how all authority has been given to Jesus. Verse 10 in the New Living Translation says, and this is the plan, at the right time he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. So finally, to today's passage, you'll be pleased to know. Paul starts by giving thanks for his friends in Ephesus and reassuring them that he is always praying for them. Paul is so aware of the blessings that he has received from God, blessings that are also promised to every believer. Paul is also absolutely sure of his status with God. And remember that dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus. He knows he is chosen and called for a purpose. And he wants his friends to know that they also are chosen and called for a purpose. And because the Bible is God's word, we can be sure that God also wants us to know today for sure that we are chosen and called for a purpose. That we are adopted and loved by God. We are holy and blameless in his sight and that we can have a close relationship with him. And sadly today, many Christians aren't sure about this. Perhaps due to circumstances in their lives, they find it difficult to believe that they are acceptable to God, that they are lovable and can be forgiven. Some believe that God chose them because he had to. It's his job. But that's a lie from Satan, as many of us are learning through the Freedom in Christ course at the moment. And if God has called us for a purpose, do we know what that purpose is? Do we ever ask God about it? What is it that he has planned for each of us? How does he want us to serve him and his church or community? And more importantly, are we willing to fall in with his purpose for us, to be obedient? And this isn't just for the likes of Tim called to ordain ministry. Paul was writing to all the members of the church at Ephesus, not just the leaders. God has a special, individually designed purpose for each one of us here today. Paul wants his readers to know who they are in Christ, and he is passionate about helping them through this letter and all the others in our New Testament. His words aren't just flowery verses like you might find in a sentimental birthday card, they are vital to our relationship with God and the way that is worked out in our relationships and the way we serve and in our churches. Paul understands that just reading this letter won't bring transformation. It needs his prayers, prayers to God the Father through Jesus the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder how often we pray for someone we care about perhaps someone in this church, to have the spirit of wisdom so that they may know God better. Not just know about God, but actually know him personally, experiencing his love, power, and transformation. Do we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they may know the hope to which God has called them? Not a hope on what might possibly happen if we're lucky, but a sure hope that we have been saved through what Jesus did on the cross and can look forward to the certainty of a wonderful eternal life with him. When we think of our friends, do we pray that they may know and experience the power of God to transform, to heal physically and emotionally, to guide, to protect? These things are no problem for God. After all, he raised Jesus from the dead, and that is power. And Paul finishes this section by reminding them of exactly who Jesus is. And this brings us right back to Christ the King. We don't have a mean, weak, powerless God. We are children of the King. That makes us princes and princesses, if you like. We're in receipt of a special inheritance which entitles us to all the blessings he promises us. And we need to grab hold of this truth and live as if we believe it. 
Again, we've been looking at this in our Freedom in Christ course. And with all the issues we see around us today, conflict in Ukraine and the Middle East, not to mention conflict in the Church of England, it's vital that we do what the writer to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, by fixing our eyes on King Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Now, as well as being Christ the King Sunday, today is also traditionally Stir Up Sunday, the day when it's traditional to give your Christmas puddings a good stir. Magda, it's good to hear you, see you here and not busy stirring Christmas puddings. But let's also make it Stir Up Sunday for us by asking Jesus by his Spirit to stir us up spiritually that we might truly know, or perhaps know again, exactly why we're here this morning. That we might know Jesus as our saviour, but also as our King of kings in a new way. That we might hear his voice, know his healing, experience his love in ways we've perhaps never known, or we haven't known for a while. Paul prayed for his friends in Ephesus. Is there someone you know who needs you to pray this prayer for them? Perhaps we should all be praying it for each other, for Tim, for our wardens, for our PCC, for our home groups, for the person we're sitting next to today. And don't forget, we need to pray it for ourselves too. And it's great to pray prayers that are in the Bible because we can be sure that we're on the right track asking for the right things. Just imagine if we all prayed this prayer, what would our church look like? In the meantime, I'm going to finish by praying it over all of us. So let's pray. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen.